Chelsea. All right, Chelsea. Okay. Tell us about who you are, what you do. Uh, yeah, my name is Chelsea. I am the founder of businessbitch.com. I'm a multi-business entrepreneur. I started getting requests for coaching. Um, so almost two years ago, I launched Business Bitch, which is where I coach and I help people go from like starting or nothing, or like they've kind of started and are somewhere in their first five years. And the sweet spot is like up to 300 K per year or that like 25 grand per month mark. Um, and I coach with like freelancers or creative freelancers, creative agencies, that kind of thing, consultants and, um, digital products and passive income, that kind of stuff. So that's, yeah, in a nutshell, that's what I do. It's a lot of fun, obviously with my brand name. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Cool community. You eliminate people right away that don't like your branding. Yeah. Yeah. But then like people who like it, love it. So we, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Super. Love it. John. Yeah, uh, John Selig, and uh, I was in sales for about 12 years, all technology. I've done everything from SDR to uh, inside sales to field sales. And uh, at a certain point, I developed this terrible allergy to things like uh, money and responsibility. And uh, I started uh, down uh, down this weird path of stand-up comedy career. Uh, never set out to become a, a full-time comedian, but became addicted to the process. And realize there's a lot of parallels between sales and stand-up comedy and today I offer comedy writing for sales teams where i show sales teams how to better understand who their buyers are why we matter to them and help them reframe all of that uh, as fun tasteful humor that illuminates business points that help them start more conversations and uh, excited to be here and uh, chelsea i do relate to that whole uh polarizing brand thing because there's some <laughs> people like comedy sales that that's not a thing that should happen <laughs> sales serious and then there's yeah. other people who are like i love this so that's yeah fun. i love it great Awesome. Nice yeah. Trent, you better have a really, really cool name because um, like the bar just keeps getting higher. <laughs> Trent's not enough for you guys. No, I mean like your, your <laughs> business name's got to be like controversial now. No, no, no. We, we keep it pretty straight laced. Um, like Chelsea though, multi-business entrepreneur, uh, first and foremost, COO and CMO of prewrite.com where we're open sourcing the art and science of storytelling. Um, so it's a SaaS product. Um, it's used by a lot of content creators, sales teams, uh, as well as marketers to uh, learn how to tell stories more effectively in, in their business. So that's part one. Part two, I had our uh, demand gen practice at leadleo.com um, where we help organizations fit uh, and find uh, land and expand opportunities in their must-have accounts. So um, yeah, always circling around the elusive uh, big fish. So Glad to be here. Super. Patrick. Uh, Patrick Downs, sales enablement and training manager at PandaDoc, podcast host, uh, launching a new Sweet Fish podcast, Customer Engagement Labs. Uh, also founder of AnnoyingDumbass.com, since we all have weird names for our businesses. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay. Brian, um, tell us what you do and um, you know how we can kind of maybe help you sharpen your sword today. Yeah, so I would be the dumbass to go off of Patrick's to expose myself to this whenever I'm in front of all you people. So um, yeah, so what I'm looking to do, I have a company called EBS Growth, and we do a couple of things. So I have a podcast called The Talent Sales and Scale Show, and our, our belief is this, that if you know how to hire really talented teams give them the ability to sell, then you're going to quickly need to learn how to scale the business. So talent, sales, and scale is where that thing was born. We started off originally from hiring salespeople. Um, So I was a 10-year sales trainer um, that, you know, got out of that and started up this business. And from that, we started to leverage technology to what you were doing, Trent, with the uh, SDRs, BDRs. Uh, We started leveraging some sales enablement. So most salespeople fall down massively on prospecting. So we started doing the the top of the funnel prospecting, leveraging some of these tools. Um, Stepping away a little bit from scaling, but our our core focus right now is on, you know, we call it the the four Ts. One, target market, right? Because if you don't have your target, the, the ideal customer profile, getting the list of contacts, you're sunk. Then two, talent management. Uh, you know, it, it's really bad. Good salespeople tend to interview like Arnold Schwarzenegger on Friday and then Pee Wee Herman shows up on Monday and you're like, what the, <laughs> right? So uh, so we, we really looked at how do you do that talent management, make sure that you have the right people in the right position because a good salesperson in one place doesn't necessarily equate to good salesperson in another. 
then training, like the tactical execution structure of, of the process. Do you need inside, outside? Are they BDRs, SDRs? How are you going about doing that? So training tackle uh, uh, or, or the setup and structure of that piece. And lastly, technology, whether it's from hiring technology to training technology. So we have a flight simulator, simulator for sales um, to uh, sales enablement tools, you know, auto dialers and the things along those lines. So that's, that's kind of the premise. So the idea is, hey, listen, there's four levers on which to pull to drive sales. It's the, the, your target, your team, your tactics or your technology. So that's kind of the idea. And, and just so I'm clear, um, like, are you, are you going to companies that need extra horsepower or are you going to companies that need you to come in and be MacGyver and kind of get them sorted out? Yeah. So that's where we're trying to, trying to home in a little bit to be, to be candid. So whenever we originally started this, so I'm out of Pittsburgh. So we have great, play, great universities like CMU, a uh, lot of startups out of there, Pitt, um, Pitt as well, a couple of others. And I saw time and time again where, uh, you know, the, the founder, super smart, and by the way, Patrick, no special uh, controller required, just, to, just right off the internet. Um, so uh, wh whenever I would see all of these founders start and they'd think, hey, I built a better mousetrap, everybody's going to come. And then they wouldn't. So then they would hire really bad salespeople, waste money and time. And then they would go to a, a, a VP of sales, waste that. Um, and so what we, we saw that time and time again. So we originally thought we'd go after these startups, but the challenge is with startups, they don't have the capital to do it. So we're looking to go up market a little bit, hit people, you know, in around that 50 people, hundred people that are a little bit more established, but don't have a lot of these tools set up. They don't have the, the, the skill set to do it. So we can come in and build it for them and, and get them started, or we can do that execution side for them. They test drive it on our dime, right? Because we've already made the investment. So they can test drive it on our dime, make sure that it works. And when it does, we hand them over a turnkey solution or we just simply do the uh, ongoing execution for them. So we think in around that 50 to 100 start and then probably caps out about that 500 to 1,000 um, in size and, and around that 500 to a thousand, we'll give them that probably that extra horsepower. Interesting. I mean, I got lots of questions, but I'd love to hear, um, you know, everybody else in terms of what you're thinking. I mean, it's interesting because you're, you're kind of figuring out um, you, you've worked with different, you know, um, ICP you could say, but I think you're trying to dial in like really what's the exact perfect one. That's key. Yes. I mean, you know, Chelsea, I'll pick on you. Um, you, you know, what you what size did you say you are you working with typically what size company or or it's um, more they're the, usually pretty small like solopreneurs or maybe have like one or two people right. on board right. um so they're getting they're starting some people are starting from nothing but they're getting up to that 300k per year mark yeah yeah and then after that i can hand them off to like other yeah. coaches if they want to grow more but yeah john what 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 size is typically like you know, do you have a, a sweet spot, like an ICP, like they have to be, they can't be a startup or there is really none for you? Uh, definitely a key feature of all my customers is they have to have budget uh, and, and a willingness to try something new and different in the sales training uh, realm. Uh, but I've worked, I've worked with companies that are, that are series A, series B, and I've worked with large enterprises like Canon Citrix. Um, you know, uh, I, I like smaller groups. I like working with a smaller team within a larger organization versus, um, you know, I did one that was 400 people across two locations uh, pre-pandemic and uh, got it done, but it's, it's not ideal. So I, like, I just want to work, I don't care about the size of the company. I just like a team of 15 to 40 people. Yeah, I guess, you know, turning the tables, if I was to look at, if, if pick on Trent and, you know, you, uh, you know, Brian, Brian ran into you uh, pre-pandemic at a, an event or something and thought, hey, I think I could maybe help you. Like, let me ask you that, Trent. Have you, when, when you bring in external people, like like someone like a Brian, you know, what, I guess, what are you typically looking for? Are you looking for somebody who can come in and kind of appoint, you know, be that MacGyver for a very specific thing? And that was a bad analogy because MacGyver does everything. But you know what I mean? <laughs> somebody that be the SWAT team to come in and fix a very specific thing? Um, yeah, I'll give one like pretty recent example. Uh, I was talking with 
the director of sales enablement for a large telecom um, company. They have 1,200 sales reps across the United States, and they've primarily been a door-to-door sales-driven organization, right? And thanks to the pandemic, they have to figure out how do we pivot? How do we turn our sales team inside um, and leverage tools like Brian, you're talking about? Um, how do we um, really train a different skill set, right? Because like knocking on somebody's door and getting that in-person appointment is very, very different than cold emailing and uh, leveraging content and all that sort of thing. So um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. Like, hey, can you, can you figure out how to help me uh, respond to changes in the marketplace faster uh, than me bumbling through it, right? Interesting. And, and Brian, let me ask you this, like when you've gotten to that, so let's say, I don't want to say you've eliminated the startup, but you've kind of said, okay, moving up market is probably a better client. Now, when you're actually talking to those prospects, do you feel like, um, you, you know, you know who the right person is in there and once you talk to them, you've got a pretty, I don't want to say convincing pitch, but, or where do you find you maybe run into the objection? Yeah, so originally what, uh, where we were running into before we had all of these, these tools uh, to be able to put, put into place, it was, oh, are you a lead generation company? Because there's a lot of just lead generation companies and, and, and typically they have bad, um, bad track records, right? They'll do one approach. They're either going to be all telephone, all email, all LinkedIn, uh, really not a lot of omni-channel. There's a lot of people trying to become omni-channel, but that's a little bit more challenging than one might imagine to get all of these systems and processes to, to work correctly together. And then the list management, list building, whenever you're burning through. So a stereotypical SDR would do about 50. If you round up, they do 50 uh, outbound attempts per day. That's a thousand a month, right? we can do 80 outbound attempts in an hour. So, you know, there's a lot of difference. So whenever you're burning through that many contacts, um, you know, things, things get pretty interesting. So once we figured all of that out, um, we thought those differentiators would be good enough, but now it's because it, it's like this, whenever you can do a whole bunch of things, it's really difficult to say the one thing that you do. So I guess that's a real challenge because what I don't want to do is go, Hey, you need a watch. How about a toothbrush? Right? So uh, I want to make sure that I see how these come together, but I'm not sure if I can clearly articulate to somebody else so they can see it through their, their own eyes. I'm also wondering for, and I don't think Chelsea, this is the case for you, but maybe it is for you, John, where anytime you come in as that external like service, you're kind of competing for somebody else's work, right? There's probably somebody internally going, no, 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 guys, I, I can help you write really good scripts. You don't need this John guy. I, I don't know if that's the case for you, Chelsea, like solopreneurs are probably going, I don't have enough time. No. I need somebody actually. No. Yeah. They, they come like pretty sold and ready to work with me specifically. So yeah, it's, <laughs> I don't have to do that. And, and you're, and you're not finding Chelsea, you're having to kind of go, you know, well, here I offer 10 things, you know, this is the one for you. Like the, the problem Brian, Brian's describing. Yeah. I mean, there is a little bit like, cause I do have a lot of offers available. So there is sometimes like, oh, well, let's figure out what's the best one for you. But it's, um, and like, the most I have to worry about is like, if they're like considering me or another coach, but it's, I mean, I don't get too caught up in worry over that, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so John, let me pick on you when like, what's the, I'm not trying to find uh, what, not, not the secret sauce, but like, how do you help, how do you help kind of convince that person? And I don't know if you run into this, Brian, but like, it isn't, you know, yes, you have somebody internally, but they're doing this on the side of their desk. So, how, you know, what do you find you typically use, John, to kind of convince people? No, it is actually worth investing and in bringing somebody else in, in you know, outside to do this. Well, I compete with any kind of external speaker slash trainer slash content provider that a sales team could bring in to work with their team. So for example, um, I've spoken with some sales animal people and they're like, because what I do, just for those who aren't clear, it's, it's really half sales training um, and it's, it's half creative workshop and transforming uh, understand, it's nailing understanding and then transforming it into something that's more relatable and memorable, uh, which flicks on an emotional switch 
for buyers, literally writing jokes about the problems we solve for our buyers. Um, and so I get all kinds of uh, prospects that I talk to and some will say, huh, so, so this is sales training. Well, we're working with Sandler and then we're gonna invest another 100K into, Ch into Challenger. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna roll that over the next five years. So there's no time to talk to you. And I'm like, well, I mean, I'm, a, I'm like a compliment to those guys. And then I get the people who are like, we want something fun and creative for our next sales meeting or, or to engage our uh, team during global pandemic. And we like this, but we've decided to bring in a juggler for sales. <laughs> um, and so, well, don't you want value? No, we, we actually don't want value. We just want some fun and frivolous. So uh, to come, coming back to your original question, I mean, look, I just talked about what is it I do and, and what are all the takeaways and learnings that are come from it and can this benefit your team? If so, great. If none of this is a value, um, you know, uh, that, that's cool. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, Ahead, and I'll say like my first business is a copywriting agency. So there was like thinking of like while John was talking, like thinking um, there was competition with like whoever they might have inside who could write or who could do this. But it was like, well, do you want like a basic service or do you want like a next level service? Um, and so like, like you said, Ryan, like you can send out like 80 an hour. Um, one of the things that I did a lot that really helped land deals was just always mapping out the numbers for people. And that pretty much, I mean, I don't know what your proposal process is like or sales process. I'm sure it's like more drawn out than like what I had to do with the copywriting agency. But um, yeah, that was something I always relied on if there was any sort of like, oh, well, we don't know if we should just like take our blogger who's like a 22 year old college grad with an English degree to write the sales content for us versus you you know does that make sense and you were and you're saying Chelsea you were always coming to them with kind of a very specific like here's here's some metrics or here's some dollar yeah I, I, yeah I, and my I, services were way more expensive too well be, because they got the better results and like were higher quality but um yeah so yeah yeah, I always like leaned on the numbers and running numbers for them and showing them like input output and what they could do with me versus staying on status quo or whatever. Yeah, and that's one one thing that we do, Chelsea, is we call it um, off of Ryan Reiser stuff, call it math of sales, right? So we have a whole entire calculator and we're typically running between 60 to 60 to 80 percent less than what they would do it internally. So there's a, a massive uh, cost savings. Uh, of, of having us execute on it. However, that said, that's one of the reasons that we, you can either um, have us build, have us, or kind of rent it where, where we're doing the work for you, or um, have us completely do, or, or have us uh, build it with you, right? So we, we have you buy the technology, get the talent, so it, we build it for you, or you can rent us, uh, us completely executing or somewhere in between is what we can do. So we can kind of pivot off of that. Um, like for example, one company that we're working with right now, they have us in a bit of a bake off with their internal team and we're about a four X of what their internal team is doing. So um, I think we are, we're, we're starting to get some good use or use cases, but it's just really on that top, top line. How do, you know, is it engaging enough right from the get go and then being able to pivot to where, uh, again, it's not like, hey, you know, which Rolex watch do you want? Oh, you don't like those? How about these, right? So it being a little bit niche, knowing that these are all integrated. And I guess that's where uh, I've, I've challenged, been challenged the most. Go ahead, John. Can you, can you Brian, just because so I'm clear, because I heard a couple of things. I heard your flight simulator for sales, but I also, which sounds like training, but I also heard we pump out 80 SDR activities an hour. Can you give me like a use case, like a classic, someone says, I want to hear the, the prototype avatar uh, customer success story of what you do. Yeah, so do you mind if I do this, which might answer that a little bit better, see how we drop into the conversation because starting right from the middle might make it a little bit of a challenge. Would it make some sense to, like I can role play with Trent or Patrick, uh, cold call you so you can see what the entry sounds like. And then from there we can see, hey, is that relevant? Would that work? 
Yeah, yeah do, do Patrick. Do Patrick. He's the best. At I like that idea. Do Patrick. All right, perfect. Yeah, it's going to be a nightmare. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, son of a gun. So this is this is my first time. So let's see how this goes. So, blup, uh, so I'm going to go blup because that's the sound that I hear in my in my mic, right? And then I'll go blup. Hey, uh, it's Brian Whittington. Uh, hello, this is Patrick. <laughs> hey, Patrick. Listen, I, I know I'm an interruption here. Uh, can I bottom line the reason I'm reaching out to you today? Uh, yeah, I got like 20 seconds. Go for it. Oh, 20 seconds. Shoot, I'm screwed. All right, well, here we go. So, hey, Patrick, the uh, reason I'm calling you is I have a company called EBS Growth, and I'm specifically talking to other CEOs, VPs of sale, whatever his title is, um, who aren't 100% satisfied with the results of their sales team, right? Who is? And they're not confident, 100% confident that they'll know exactly which lever to pull to see an improvement. So, Patrick, that's the reason for me reaching out to see if you'd be terribly opposed to finding about the four levers that we found that you can pull on to drive better sales execution, better sales results. So uh, open-minded to scheduling some time to discuss that. Uh, what specifically do you do, Brian? I mean, I'm, I'm a little confused. Yeah, so no worries, my fault, right? I should be on a uh, on on five by Friday to figure this this language out a little bit better. But uh, so really, uh, we call it the four T's, right? One, can you target the right ideal customer profile? Do you have the contacts? Because that that target market, that that list is your strategy. Then two, if you've identified that, does your team, are they able to execute on that? Do they have the skill set, the right structure? Are we holding them accountable? So it really gets down to the team. The, the third that we work on is really the tactics. Are, does your team need help to execute on the tactics or do they need some help in getting somebody else like we execute on that top of the funnel or lastly, technology? Are we leveraging technology in a way that gives us the biggest lift where we can have reduced headcount but more output? So those are all the different areas in which we play. Those are the four levers on which you can pull. So Patrick, I, I don't know, are any of those relevant worth a brief conversation? Uh, potentially. It sounds like you're like a consultant that also has some outsourced salespeople. Is that the vibe I'm getting? Yeah, I'd say that's a, a, a good summation. We can either come alongside, help you build it through consulting. We okay. can execute it with our sales team, or we can uh, allow you to leverage the technology that we do through, uh, you know, we're channel sales on a lot of the technology that we're using that you can bring into your own team. Okay. Yeah. Feel free to send me an email so I can sort of digest that information a little bit. And uh, I could talk to my team and see if there's any way we can you know, get back to you. And sure. So you're, enough. I have your email as blah, 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 blah. Is that right? Yes. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Got it. Hey, so uh, my marketing team is insane. They have so much stuff. What, sh what specifically should I send you that would uh, catch your attention the most whenever you're looking at your sales team execution? I mean, they're probably doing all right now. Yeah, we're doing all right. We're hitting our number. Um, I think I just like to hear more about the 4T thing you were talking about, just like the four areas you help with. That was just a lot of information. So sometimes yeah. it's easier for me just to read it on my own. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I'll, I'll send that over to you. And then, you know, I, I don't know if you're like me, I get 200 emails in a day. Would it be worthwhile to set up a, some time to discuss that? Because everything I'm going to say in an email might not be as, as applicable or clearly understandable as us grabbing 30 minutes on the telephone, go through it. Worst case scenario, you're grabbing a couple of good ideas. Best case scenario, you're finding that we can help. Open to that. Uh, yeah, send me an email and maybe put your calendar link in there if, if I can digest the information a little better and, and understand exactly what you guys do. Uh, maybe we can set up a time. Fair Just enough. Customized. Okay, so out of role play, I would end it there so I don't become a pain in the neck. Shoot it over to him, put him on a follow up. Awesome, I'd love to hear. I could see, I could see uh, John's like clenching his pen. Um, he's ready to write a whole new. Uh, but yeah, John, Trent, uh, Chelsea, please, and obviously Patrick, feedback. John, you're chomping at it. Go for it. Yeah, I can. I, I can go first. I mean, I just I jotted down two things. Um, Look, I'm, I'm all about, you know, being cutting to the chase, getting right there and, and being like feeding them stuff that they need to hear really early on that says this call is for me. Um, and so I would have liked to hear her, you know, um, you know, sales challenges are all uh, sales leaders are always challenged by which variables to tweak to, um, to improve performance. Um, you know, and you can maybe list those four. 
and uh, you know, start to just figure out a way to frame that so that they're basically going, oh, this person is speaking my language. And uh, there's, you know, he's giving me a few things to think about, ultimately leading to the one he might want to talk about, uh, which might steer the conversation a little bit more, like getting to the heart of the matter a little bit, right, uh, a little bit quicker about what's bugging him. Um, that, that was the first bit of feedback I had. The other one was Patrick, Patrick's reply was, he wasn't super dismissive, but he wasn't like hot to trot. And he basically said, send me the email, which is code for, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, but you went in to ask for the meeting and it, it sort of didn't make sense at that point. It, he hadn't fully, he hadn't fully bought in. Um, so that, that, that's my two bits of feedback. I hope the first one was clear. It felt like there was a long wind up to get to the why, like Patrick wasn't fully certain why you're calling. And if you could just get to the problem, which is you want better performance. Um, you know, these are the four T's you're dealing with. Uh, do you have a clear idea of which ones you need to adjust? Um, to me, that would have been a little bit more to the, to the point and to the chase, cutting to the chase. Okay. Yeah. Valid feedback, thanks. I would just echo that like the first part of the call just sounded very jargony and like you started big and then went into the point after Patrick had to ask some, whoops, sorry for knocking my mic after he had to ask some questions. Um, so if you, like maybe restructuring your script so you can go to the heart of it. And one thing I noticed too, is you have four things that you do, like the four T's or whatever. Um, if you know much about the company before you call, I think it would really help to like zero in on one of the ones that you think, or that, you know, would be most relevant to them if you know um but yeah i think really pulling out a common pain point to lead with would be more effective than just like doing the long roundabout introduction and then having to have the prospect ask you questions to clarify what you're calling about or what this is even about besides like generic sales do you know what i mean um and if you have someone who's good with copy, they should be able to help you do that. So okay, something, else thank you. Was, something else to add was, and, and maybe I said this, but I mean, whether the sales leader is crushing it or not, they want to do better. They always want to do better. And you're basically saying that we have four T's that can help you. We can tweak one, um, can get you there. And, and that's just something that I think that's that, that's common with every sales leader, and I think you, you just need to demonstrate that, like, we want to help no matter how you're doing, um, we can help you do better uh, through these four variables. Go for it, it. It's tough to pitch just one service, let alone four, um, and and I think that's very uh, very difficult. So what I would do is take more of like a diagnostic approach, right? So if you don't know um, what trigger or what what lever to pull for them. Um, chances are they're not going to give you the time to go through all, all four yourself, right? So um, I think framing it up something as, hey, most sales leaders I talk to, even if they are hitting 100% quota, always are looking for a way to get better. They just don't know which lever to pull. I created this custom diagnostic that I can send to you. No, no risk, no whatever. Um, it takes about five minutes to complete. And on the outside, on the, at the outcome of that, um, we'll find one specific uh, or two levers that you might be able to pull to increase, uh, you know, your performance and then be a much more of a consultative sell from there. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, I felt really overwhelmed. Like as Patrick myself, like I actually did not know what to say to you. Like I, I felt very lost in what you were saying and you, you have the opposite problem that most people have is where they'll come in, they have no structure or process. Your structure and process is amazing. And you have like the beginning, middle and end mapped out, you know where you need to get to and you have a strong understanding of sales concepts. But I didn't feel an understanding of like what you actually do or like what you solve to the point where it like made me feel something. Like it made me actually wanna to respond to you in a way that would be, would be what you wanna hear. Um, I, I hear people talk about the jobs to be done interview a lot. I think that might be helpful for you to do. Like I have a list of questions that I use personally. I just put it in chat where I just go through with like five personas of five different kinds of companies I've worked with and ask them these questions to fully understand what the process was like before me, what it's like now, what the major problems were, what their day-to-day -day is like, how it impacted their day-to-day. -day. So you can speak more in story instead of like so high level that it's hard for me to connect with. 
Got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Patrick's saying there. Like, you know, most, you know, most people we sometimes don't like the, the, the they don't exactly know even how to articulate the value proposition. I don't think you have any problem there. Mm -hmm. But I think the I think the four levers I'm I'm struggling with because I feel like you you know I would I would want to talk to whoever it is that you're you're speaking to, whether it's a CMO or CEO or a CRO. And, and really dig into that one lever you think is going to be the one like that's going to solve their problem. And then there can be kind of the, by the way, I have three other levers, but I think that one thing, I think Chelsea was saying that like, um, you know, you, you almost should maybe know like, Hey, you know, I think you're in charge of revenue. I think this lever is probably going to be, and if they say, well, that, and you can say, you know, this is what we find. We also have other uh, levers, but this is typically the one we find. Cause I think, like Patrick was saying, kind of coming in saying, I have like four different ways. It's just like, oh man, like it's a lot. Yeah, because the people you talk, like you're very knowledgeable about what you do. And like um, Patrick said, you've really got it locked down and on point, which is great and fantastic. Like people would want to work with someone like you in a company like yours. But like when you're cold calling, like people are starting from zero and it's like, it takes time for them to get their brain on board and like ramp up. Um, and this was something that I saw with copywriting a lot was like, people would just want to go in and they're all excited and everything, which is amazing and great, but you have to like ramp people up as well. So you need to take them like baby step, baby step, baby step. And then you can start taking the leaps instead of just taking the big leaps at the beginning of the conversation. When you jump in with like all four things that you can do and all this stuff. Okay. So here's all good and valid feedback. And let me give you one of my, uh, my, my weaknesses is why say anything in 10 words when 30 would do so nicely. So um, that, that came through. Um, so uh, here's, here's the, the other obstacle that we need to come up with then. If I went one spe specific, it's very easy to get bucketed into commodities because unfortunately standalone one thing that we do is all commoditized. Oh, you do list building. Oh, you do recruiting. Oh, you do, right? And we do all sub bullets off of that and a little bit more expanded. So that's why going up at that high level. So I'm almost looking, Patrick, for them to go, what is it that you do? Because as soon as I get that, I have now a conversation and now we're into a sales conversation. So I'm almost looking for that. Um, so that's not necessarily bad on uh, for me. However, retweaking it and restructuring it and paring it down might be better. So that is a backdrop. Do you have a suggestion on what to do there? Because my fear is if I take your advice, which I've tried on, on some things, but it was more straightforward on the uh, on on the um, outsourced sales team. Uh, do you have any suggestions there on how not to get bucketed or commoditized? Because that's like the kiss of death for us. Did you pair two things together instead of just going for one, you could pair two that are usually not together. So that way there's an immediate additional value proposition than what the like commodity services have. Um, like I forget what the four T's are, but if one typically doesn't come with the other and you've kind of figured out that one is what people need most or what this prospect needs most. Um, and then you can say, we take that and do this. And then that, that kind of leads them along the steps and then you can keep talking. So that would maybe cause like a, oh, wait a minute, you do that together with this too. And so you can like take that conversation deeper. That's a great idea, Chelsea. Cause like you hear the, the bucket technique all the time. Uh, like Kevin Dorsey talks about it. You call somebody it's like, hey, people I talk to typically fit in this bucket or this one, uh, mm -hmm. which one are you? And then you get them to just tell you that and then you have the conversation from there. But one, one thing I was thinking of, and I'm curious what the group thinks is, in, you know, I, I know we've been kind of giving them a hard time about the four, but I'm wondering if you lead with saying, look, I think this one um, lever, whatever you want to use, is, is something we can help you with out of the four that we offer. So, you know, you're, you're not just focusing on the commodity. Go ahead, John. No, continue, because, yeah, go. Well, so, so you're, you know, you, it, it kind of gives you a, a something to fall back on if they're like, yeah, that one thing wouldn't help and be like, exactly. You know, we often help with 
two, three, and four versus coming at them. You know, it's kind of like you're coming at them and you're smashing them in the head with this massive toolbox versus going, hey, this screwdriver will fix your problem. And they might go, no, no, that's not what I need. Great, I have a wrench in here. But when you smash them in the head with the toolbox, you smash them in the head with the toolbox. So what I, what I was going to add is uh, I worked with a sales trainer once and they wanted me to write jokes for cold calls. And, and, and one of the jokes we wrote was, uh, hey, I speak with a lot of sales leaders just like you and they're all struggling with discounting, long cycles and slippage. And a sales executive's problems shouldn't sound like a midnight trip to Walmart. Now, the reason why I'm telling that joke is because in the first like six seconds of, of the call, I'm hitting them with three buzzwords that are not, not buzzwords, but three things that are on their mind. And you have four. I'm just wondering if there's, you don't, I'm not telling you to structure a joke around it, but if you were to lead really quickly with sales leaders are always trying to figure out uh, the ones who are trying to improve or trying to are struggling with target hiring practices. You don't have to use the T things. Maybe you get a little more granular in your, your wording. Just be hyper, hyper specific about things that are important to them. Um, and then, you know, the question is, is it, is it a joke? I'm not suggesting it is but it's, it's trying to get them to try to flick on those switches for them uh, by demonstrating your, your subject matter expertise and your relevancy as early in the, the message it's kind of Francois triggered me there. And, and that's, that's kind of, that's an approach to consider as well. I don't think a joke's a bad idea if, if it can, <laughs> as you probably yeah, know, if, can, if yeah. it can be done well. Oh, it's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I wish I thought that. of it. Uh, but, but I'm just saying that the reason the psychology of that joke I told you is I list three things that are very, uh, that are top of mind for a CRO. So when I say them, it gets their attention. I'm like this person's speaking my language. Um, whether you want to fill in with a punchline, I encourage it. But the question could, the, you know, instead of a punchline, maybe it's, um, you know, which of these in your mix, did you have a clear handle of which, which variables you feel you need to tweak? I like the late night trip to Walmart, but. And I think a lot of I think a lot of buzzwords could fit into that punchline. Yeah, sure. Brian, it kind of sounds like it's uh, somewhat dependent upon who you're talking to, right? So if you're talking to a startup CEO who maybe doesn't have a, a sales team, right, the conversation is a lot different. And then you can position yourself as the right hand uh, of the sales organization without having to incur the cost or something like that versus talking to a VP of sales that has a very different set of things that keep uh, him or her uh, up at night, so to speak. Don't actually say that, but um, it sounds like you have to kind of eat some of your own dog food and, and develop a target that uh, makes the most sense for you too. So let me, I'm taking all your feedback and jotting down some ideas here. Let me, let me run back this past you, if you don't mind. All right. Uh, Patrick, since I screwed up with you the first time, can I try it again? Go for it, man. Son of a gun. All right, here we go. So blah, 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 blah. So Patrick, the reason I'm specifically reaching out to you is, let's face it, leaders of, of sales are never, never satisfied with, with, even if we're doing well, where sales are. And, and it's a complex problem to solve of how to improve. And we never know which variable to, to pull on. Well, Patrick, I think that we discovered a way to take the, the complexity out and make it easy. We've identified four buckets. Uh, and, and that's the reason I'm reaching out to you, Patrick, is to, to identify these four buckets, see which one might be the best lever for you to improve upon for your sales performance. Still wordy, but is that getting there? It's I like a lot, it's a lot of lead up. Okay. No, but, but, I, but, but you can shorten it. I saw a bunch of, as you were going, yeah. Yeah. That can be chopped up and it's definitely better, I think. Yeah. Patrick's like, um, you know, I, I can see his brain working because we've been doing this for a year. And when 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 he flips it around, he like, he, you know, I, I don't know if you've already tried to reverse engineer it. And I'm not saying that that it, that's what yours should be, Brian. But I know Brian, uh, Patrick, like you start with like these. It's like a one sentence. 
Yeah. Like I usually get invited in by people who have these problems. Then I just list three problems and I try to keep it under like 20 seconds and then ask which one's oh, interesting. Resume. Okay, so it'd be so your 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 approach there, Patrick, would be, hey, listen, the reason I'm reaching out to you is I, I typically get invited by other heads of have heads of sales because one, they're frustrated that they can't find the right talent to hire. Two, they hire them, but then they're not performing. Yes. Or three, um, you know, they're performing, but they're getting crushed by their competition because they don't have the right talent or the ta technology and tactics to to compete. Yes, that's and much better because like I can focus so much easier when it's that short. That's not a bad idea, I like that. And, and then Patrick, is it true that your next line would be like, you know, which one of these three applies to you? Yeah, and you could even go for the negative if you're feeling fancy. Like I imagine you're gonna yeah. tell me that none of that applies to you. Yeah, but I'm could guessing none one. of these would, yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. That's uh, good. This is recorded, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so my, my utter humiliation is on, on file and then the recording is going to cut off right before we got to that. Shoot. <laughs> it's like, oh, we forgot to record this one. Yeah, son oh, of damn a... Damn it, Brian. <laughs> All right. And then if I could get John to give me a joke and then I'll be sweet. <laughs> well, you could have just added Walmart at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. Uh, more than happy if you could send me... Uh, 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 I don't have Venmo up here in Canada, but yeah, that would be sweet. <laughs> yeah. Well, Listen, if you, sent him, if you sent him five bucks American, that's like a week's worth of wages in Canada. No, the exchange has dropped, my friend. It's not as good as you can do. It's down 25 bucks. <laughs> so so uh, I guess the curious thing would be, uh, does your... Does your uh, does looking at your sales team uh, cause you as much, uh, as much fear as walking into Walmart at two in the morning? I mean, the worst that can happen no, is awkward, awkward silence, but <laughs> yeah, no, but, but, I get but, that a lot. But to what, Pat, what Patrick just said kind of is similar to what I've mentioned, which is I'm using three problems in that set to the joke for that that's relevant to a sales leader, which is discounting long cycles and slippage. This is their jargon. This is, these are their challenges. Yeah. And so if you can, if you can take what, take Patrick's approach, merge it with mine, uh, figure out how to shorten those three problems and find some parallel between those three problems and something else, uh, you'll have your joke. Yeah. Also just think specific, right? Like your problems are good, but I feel like they're kind of high level still. If you could make them more like rounded, I think that would be helpful. Well, and- Like use an example. And, and Brian, I mean, obviously today you, you had to be a bit generic in your defense, but if, if Patrick was Panda Doc, you know, my guess is you'd, probably do a little bit of homework and go, look, you know, I, I see you guys are, you know, hiring these people. I read this about you. I think I can help you with this problem. So I, I'm, I'm assuming you can obviously get specific. Oh, absolutely. And, and um, so we, we, we use uh, the terminology and let me see if this, this would work on you, Patrick, something along the lines of, um, I'll give the example and then I'm going to ask a question off of this because once you go into stories, you're well past that 20 seconds. Um, so, you know, you can give me some insights on that one, but it's, uh, you, you know, Patrick, how whenever you, uh, you hire people, they're all excited. They tell you that they're the best prospector in the world. And then you're sitting there wondering what in the world they're doing. You don't see any activities. They're not putting any results on, on, on the board. We help with that. Yep. So like that approach. Now, how do you do that in sets of three, though, within 20 seconds? I think, as John was saying, using jargon can help. Like, you can use that as shorthand, for example, just to kind of hack into the way they talk. Yeah. Because I still felt like you weren't really in the VP of sales mind by saying what you were saying. Like, I, I like to talk about when I'm selling PandaDoc, like, Q, Q2 budgets, what's going on with that? Like, if you miss your forecast, how are you going to budget out for next quarter? Yeah. You just use things that they would be talking about like daily meetings. Okay. I personally like the uh, Schwarzenegger to PB Herman example. Yeah. <laughs> that actually stuck, that stuck in my mind, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, that's the PB Herman guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, well, it's what Josh Braun says, right? In the sea of white circles, how do you become a red X? And right. By uh, using those types of examples, I think that's how you do it. So what I got off uh, those two is, um, you know, break up better into personas. So break up that list to its only VPs or only 
right? So not, not be so generic and, and more specificity in the examples. Um, yeah, I'm bringing in some humor into it, like you said, Trent and John. Okay. So are you, Ryan, just out of curiosity, are you, are you, I mean, you're the one doing the cold calling? So I, I have uh, me and my other uh, other team. So we're we're putting this into practice, and we're we just started uh, started with this script maybe this week, and you know going back you have to listen to the the tapes. So I figured I'd shortchange it by jumping on here and 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 getting uh, skewered. I know, good on you, man. I mean, you want to try it one more time? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. So let me uh, let me put some bullet points down. Um, all right, so we'll say VPS sales. And, and I'd say like, you know, use, use Patrick at Panadoc, like use a, you know, he's at, you know, he's at Panadoc, you know, they're, they're, they're growing. Um, I, I think they're, they're hitting their targets. So that, you know. They, they don't need you, but who knows, maybe you can help make it better. Yeah. But there right, are problems so still that you can find. Oh, there always are, right? Yeah. So, um, so I'll start off with this. Um, this is just going to be complete ad lib. So here we go. Uh, so, uh, Patrick, I appreciate you. Or uh, Patrick, the reason I'm I'm calling is I have a company called EBS Growth, and I'm specifically reaching out to you because in talking with other VPs of sales, they're oftentimes frustrated over the fact of you know we're we're missing Q2 as I'm watching my people sit around not doing the activities that they need to and my managers don't know how to manage them. Or, or other times they're seeing our competition coming up and, and they seem to always be just ahead of us. And I'm wondering, is it our people? Is it our technology? Is it our team? I, I'm not 100% sure. And bottom line, Patrick, those are the things we help with, but, but I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing none of those are relevant for you. That was so much better. That was so good. I feel like, and, and I'm not just trying to be hypercritical, but I feel like even just the very first part about like introducing yourself and EBS, like, I don't know if you can even just shrink that a bit more. Like it feels like just kind of getting in is still, and I know some people say, you know, you kind of just put the problem right out there. So I know there's like some people that totally disagree with that, that you need to be a bit more formal, like who I am, where I'm calling from. And some people just get on there and just ask the problem. So I don't know what, what everyone here thinks. I, I personally think it's important to identify yourself and who you're with, but, but get to the problem. Like, you know, no, no other hyperbole conjecture or whatever words we can throw in there. Just, just kind of, it's, I just think it's courtesy to identify yourself so they know who they're talking to. And maybe they have, maybe they've heard of your company, uh, but also they haven't and that's okay, but just get, get to the problem. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and, and I think there's also like a bit of a debate on asking for permission to ask to, to like, like just, Hey, it's John from XYZ is that, you know, here's a problem. Does this sound familiar versus, Hey, it's John, how's your day? Do you have time? Like some people are like, no, you, you basically, yeah. <laughs> they answer the phone. They gave you permission. <laughs> just take it. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. I was, yeah, because I just don't answer the phone, but then when I do, it's like, well, I answered, so I decided to have a conversation. Yeah, I always love the people that answer the phone and say, I'm in a meeting. Well, you answer the phone, man. Your fault. Let's go. <laughs> well, there's got to be like a yeah. stat, right? Like if you ask somebody if they have time, 90% are going to say no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We always uh, teach the team to couch it in a negative. Hey, I'm probably catching their bad second. Why do we acknowledge this stuff? Literally, they answered the phone. The floor is yours. Go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't ask for permission. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, I think, I mean, and maybe it's just that very first piece, but I agree with Patrick. It's a lot more succinct now. And, and personally, I would even say after you describe that first problem, I'd maybe go, does, you know, does this even sound familiar? Yeah. Is that relevant worth a brief conversation kind or, of thing? Or, or I bet this doesn't apply to you. And they might say, no, it doesn't. Then you can pivot to the, maybe the other problem, or they might say, yeah, it does. So then you can dig in there. But why, why would we say, I bet this doesn't apply to you? Why are we calling them if we're betting it doesn't apply to them? Like to me, that, that's incongruent. So it, it's a curious thing. It's called, I want to be right or I want to win tactic. you right. So it's, hey, you wouldn't want to go out to, uh, for dinner. Nope. Shoot. I was right. No, I, I would. I win. 
right? So I want to be right or I want to win. And it's really curious. Whenever you say, I'm guessing you don't have that, they go, well, actually I do. Because there's a psychology that makes you want to disprove it. Like, no, you're wrong. All right, tough guy. It, it's really, really curious. Is this an American phenomenon? Forgive me, because I... <laughs> It could be. I don't like, know. I just kind of say go in with confidence. Yeah. Pa Patrick, you seem depends to be a fan on your of it, and, and I, 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 don't, I don't disagree with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it really depends on how you deliver it. It's one of those things where, like, if you're not sure. really into the idea and you don't believe it, don't use it. But if you think it could be a cool tactic, it can really go off well, especially if you have the personality to back it up. Yeah, and you just have to be very careful because if you start to do it too often, it can be used as a bludgeoning tool and you just look like a big A. <laughs> yes. Well, the way I've, he I've heard Patrick use it, and I'm not saying you're, you're not doing it well, Brian, and I'm not saying it's the, the end-all be-all, John, but you know, when, when we've been on some of these calls, like he's very nonchalant about it. Like, hey, we do this and do this and this and this. I bet, you, you know, does this, I can't even remember how you say it, Patrick, but. You know, I imagine that wouldn't apply in your world though. So it's not arrogant. Yeah, it's, all, it's confident, but it's not arrogant. It, it's all delivery and it's all style and, and different things work for different people. Yeah. And I think, you know, us Canadians could use a bit more of it, John. <laughs> like so, if you, one, one uh, so if you uh, check out uh, two things, Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. He goes for that. A lot, of, a lot of Sandler technique in there. And there's a book called you aren't that smart or you aren't as smart as you think you are or something like that. And one of his 31 structures uh, gives that suggestion where they, they literally try to prove you're wrong. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with disc profile, but especially those high C, those analytical, oh my gosh, they are just chomping at the bit to prove you wrong. Those are the people that it works really well with. Same with that high mm -hmm. D, those direct type. Those two are the ones that it works really well with. I think that's the that's the hard part though of the cold call. How do you know where they fit on the disc profile, right? I mean, you could immediately. I, Patrick's got the style down and, and the tone, and it's her, it's his persona. Um, well, it, it's it's kind of curious if you so do me a favor. Do you mind if I uh, play an exercise with you? Um, do it. I can run the Unfortunately, all right. Here we go. We'll we'll do this and we'll run. Um, answer the phone the way you would. So if I say. Uh, Hey, it's Brian Whittington. Go, Trent. What's going on, Brian? All right. Hey, it's Brian Whittington. Go, Francis or Francois. Hey, Brian. Okay. If I go to John, hey, it's Brian Whittington. Uh, who? Yep. Okay. If I go to Patrick, hey, it's Brian Whittington. What's up, Brian? Okay. And Chelsea, last one. Hey, it's Brian Whittington. Uh, hey, do I know you? Okay. Every single one of you answered slightly differently. And so now I know a disc profile. John's a DC, Patrick's a DI, uh, Trent's probably a DI. Francois didn't quite pick that up, but that allows me then to go through the rest of the, 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 um, the call based upon how they respond. So if it's that real quick, I bullet point it. If it's more, hey, do I even know you? Then I'm gonna slow things down and be more personable. So depending on that trend, to, to answer your question. And that's how I get their disc profile real quick. Like, cool. Love it. Awesome. Well, I know a, a bunch of people got uh, meetings to run to. Brian, thanks for uh, being on the hot seat. Everybody else, love that you gave up some time to, to help Brian out. This was super fun, super helpful. Um, have a great weekend. Thanks everybody thanks for you your too. help. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, See you all soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.